the Murato uh, project over the last four years. Um, I, I'll briefly introduce the team, tell people what's going to happen, and, and then we'll move on. So we've got four people who've been working on the project, myself, uh, Mikateka Matabulu, who's going to present on the Photo Boys project today, Patience Mukwamba, and Monica McLean. So, and it's really nice to see some familiar names and, and lots of unfamiliar names, which makes it really interesting. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with the project, just to say uh, very briefly, can you move the slides on, Mikateko? Next slide. Um, just to say very briefly that the point of this project and probably the, the aims and objectives have shifted or been refined slightly as it's continued because we're now in our fifth year of the project. But the idea was to look at how low-income young people from rural and township schools, uh, predominantly from rural schools, actually manage to access higher education, to participate, to succeed and then move into work. So what, what, what are the factors that enable them to, to get on or which gets in their way? And I think broadly what we've been attempting is to combine a structural analysis, which we understand as conversion factors, with also taking agency um, very seriously. So we are attempting a capabilitarian analysis which problematizes opportunities, obstacles and outcomes and advances our understanding of what is needed for justice for, for students from these kinds of backgrounds who get into higher education. Um, and then, of course, when we started five years ago, decoloniality was not on the agenda in the way that it, it has emerged in, in the last year or two. So we're also trying to understand the project as a contribution to, to the decolonial methods and practices and, and thinking and trying to think that through. For the project as a whole, we've got multiple data sets. So we've got secondary data sets which have been drawn from census data, um, household data, labour market statistics, and we've combined those in particular ways to get a picture of the districts from which these students come, the rural districts they come from in Limpopo, the Eastern Cape and KwaZulu-Natal. We work with selected documents. We designed an original survey which we ran at one university and we have four waves of life history interviews, which started in uh, 2017 with the last lot of interviews happening in 2020. And we managed to retain 58 of the 65 students across the four waves of interviews. And these students come from five different universities, two of them in rural areas and three in urban areas. And then we also had alongside this a participatory photo voice project because we wanted an element of the project which would involve students as, as researchers and not simply on, on the receiving end of interviews. And it's this photo voice project that we want to, to focus on today. Um, the, the structure of, of the afternoon then is that Patience is going to very briefly outline some of the core features of the capability approach. Most of the session is going to be spent with Mikateko talking about the participatory photo voice project and taking questions. And then Monica is briefly going to round things up by introducing the capability domains that have emerged from, from this project and, and talk about what we're going to be doing next in terms of, of sharing and disseminating the research. And then we plan to close at about quarter past three. Um, it is possible to per, to post questions in the, the chat room as we go, um, if, if you want to do that. So I'm going to hand over to Patience. Uh, before I do that, can I just remind everybody to make sure that you're on mute, unless there's a point at which you want to ask a question. So uh, can we move on to the next slide, Mikateko, and can I hand over to Patience at this point? Thank you. Thanks, Melanie. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's nice to see some of you and it's nice to be able to talk about the project. So as Melanie said, I'm just going to briefly outline the framework that we used for the study to analyze the data, as well as the major tenants. So we use the capabilities approach as the framework for analysis. And this approach was pioneered by Amatya Sen and developed by other researchers such as Martha Newsbaum, Ingrid Robbins, and they all, uh, they all used it in different areas of research. So it is a normative framework that uses a broad informational basis in assessing well-being. 
So in its evaluation of well-being, it links material, mental and social well-being or the economic, social, political and cultural dimensions of life. So in this way, it brings together the different aspects that make up human life and influence well-being. So the capabilities approach focuses on people's freedom to be or do what they have reason to value. And like I said, it has been applied in different disciplines and areas of research. And in our case, we're applying it to the higher education space. So as it is applied to higher education, it normatively positions higher education as a public good that should open up opportunities for students to imagine different ways of being and doing and to develop. <laughs> Sorry. To develop agency to pursue what they have reason to value. So like Melanie said, we're working with students from low income, rural and urban areas. So this was seeing how they would alternatively imagine different ways of how they can move on with their life, different ways of how they can live their lives differently to what is generally around them in the communities that they, that they stay in. So in this way, it enables an evaluation of the arrangements within the university higher education policy arrangements, and the possible effects of the broader socio-political environment in expanding students' well-being. So the major tenets of the approach, um, capabilities, functionings, agency, and conversion factors, and these are the ones that I'll briefly talk about now. So, so we, have we have capabilities as the real opportunities of freedoms for people to do what they value and be the kind of person that they want to be. So because it is a study on higher education, we focus on capabilities related to university education, such as epistemic contribution and navigation. Uh, Monica will say a bit more about these capabilities and how they relate to the students that we were, we were working with. And then the functionings, these were the practical realizations of one chosen way of life. So such as being educated, being employed, it's, so the difference between functionings and capabilities between the effectively possible, that is the freedom and the realized, that is the achievement. So this is what we're using to look at, to measure the basis of well-being, the capabilities that they have and the functionings that they then achieved. So, and also now when we look at agency, we realize that people need to be active participants in change rather than passive or docile recipients. So agency is regarded as bringing about change that one values. It can be social or personal agency. So personal is bringing about a, a change that you personally value. And while social agency is for the change, for the good of society. So in our case, the students were talking about changing the, the conditions of their families, you know, they were from low income households and now bringing about material change and also for their broader communities to say there was a lot of uh, maybe some instances of crime, violence, students not going to school. So they were talking about bringing about that kind of change using their, their education to bring change to their community so that education is valued more so that students can realize that function more. And then conversion factors. So in looking at this process, we use conversion factors and this is the degree of freedom to which a person can convert resources into a functioning. So the resource in this case was higher education, and we were looking at how free the students were, the opportunities that they had to convert that higher education into the functioning of being educated, the functioning of being employed. So in this way, conversion factors either facilitate or hinder the conversion of resources into capabilities of functioning. So we group them according to material and non-material factors. So we needed to evaluate the, the freedom that students had to convert their resources into further study or employment. So the material would include, for example, funding or money, which was very pertinent in, in the study, where students had to have funding to apply to university. They had to have funding to um, go maybe to open days at the university. They had to have funding to go to good schools that would equip them 
with the capabilities to enter into higher education, that would enable them to get the good grades to get into higher education and into universities and fields of study of their choice. Right? And then the non-material factors would include um, the social ones. These relate to so societal conditions such as public policies, relations and networks that students had around them, such as families, uh, the teachers, and then also, also issues, issues of race. And then the personal factors, these are also under non-material. They would relate to the individual, for example, the physical conditions, gender, the person's aspirations, the person's values. So most of the students that we had in their study, they really valued hard work and they really had to push in university to realize their dream of being educated. And then we also had environmental factors. And in our study, like Melanie said earlier, we were looking at students from rural and uh, township uh, areas. So this was the environment that we were mostly focusing on. And we would look at things like how the environment enabled them to access good schools, access university, access information on the different universities and studies and programs that they could study at university. So by using conversion factors, we were looking at how education would enable the functioning of getting a job and how a person will be able to turn that education into a valuable functioning. So we find that people have different degrees of converting resources into functionings. And this was mostly dependent on the conversion factors around them, the social, personal, personal environment, environmental factors that were around them. So that, that was the, how we were looking at the data and analyzing it and moving forward. Um, thank you very much. I turn it over to Mika. Good afternoon, everyone. In this section of the presentation, I'm going to play a short video um, that explains why we thought it would be important to incorporate a participatory strand in our research. Um, in this video, you'll see how we see the value of uh, photo voice and um, its importance um, for the broader, the broader project. So after this, I will go into a bit more detail as to what we actually did to implement the photo voice project, as well as what we learned from it, what we learned from students, what students themselves learned from the process and what they valued about it. So I'm going to play this video. It's quite short, just under three minutes. And then after that, I will uh, say more about photo voice. The video isn't playing. Did somebody say the video isn't playing? It isn't playing. I can't see it, it play. It is playing. I can see it. I can see it too. Yeah. So I think. Carry on. All right. Across South Africa. And every group attended a series of workshops to develop the university.
That's really unfortunate, but the video seems to be stalling um, quite a bit. So I'm just going to let it uh, sort of continue uh, loading. Um, I'm not sure if this is a problem on my side in terms of the internet connection, but I'm going to move on to the next slide and perhaps we can come back to playing the video um, at the end of the, the webinar. So what we would have seen in the in the video explained to us is that traditional methods used in higher education research, for example, the interviews, the questionnaires that we mentioned using, may carry and represent the residual cultural presence of colonization um, in the sense that they tend to maintain top down or expert versus layperson or even researcher versus research participant dichotomies um, that mirror power inequalities. So in contrast to these traditional methods, participatory research, uh, we think, can address misrecognition by enabling more people who are stereotyped as lacking epistemic materials to actually contribute to shared pools of knowledge. In our research, in our project, it allowed us to acknowledge low-income students uh, from rural and township areas, as mentioned before, as legitimate producers of higher education knowledge drawing on their experiences of what it was like to be at university, as well as how they understood, learned and talked about exclusions and inclusions at university. To give you a bit more detail about how we implemented the Photo Voice project, um, individual photo stories were developed by 19 of the 65 students who we worked with, and they produced uh, photo stories that they worked on at four at, at a workshop that we conducted in the Free State, Limpopo, and in Gauteng. At these workshops, students uh, received basic photography training. Um, they had discussions about the theme of exclusion and inclusion at university, particularly in terms of how their experiences of inclusion and exclusion were affecting their engagement in processes of learning and therefore affecting their ability to achieve valued learning outcomes. At these workshops, they also developed storyboards, so making decisions about what they actually wanted their stories to be about, um, thinking about the type of photographs they might want to take to represent various themes that they wanted to highlight in their stories. And following these discussions and the development of storyboards, they presented these for feedback within the group. And then after this, they had an opportunity to actually go out and do a kind of trial run of taking photographs um, that were aligned with the narrative that was developed in their storyboards. They then came back uh, to the group after having the first or initial round of taking photographs and presented the initial ideas to the group where students then had discussions around whether the photographs they were taking worked in terms of being reflective of the themes or the issues that they wanted to um, have their story be about. And then if they felt that they needed to take better photographs, they went out um, into the field and took those photographs before returning, deciding on a final set of six photographs, um, ordering them in a particular way that would tell a story with a beginning, a middle sort of turning point and an ending, as well as thinking about the moral or the message um, that they wanted their stories to convey. So when we provided this photography training, there was also an element of uh, making sure that students understood both the value of um, the aesthetic value of a photo story, but also making sure that it really captures what they wanted to say and what they wanted to highlight about the issue of inclusion and exclusion at universities and how this affects their learning outcomes. So from these workshops, we produced um, a series of outputs, including 19 photo stories that were then put into photo books per province, as well as a collective photo book, uh, which I will share with you in a minute. In this collective photo book, the students worked together in order to make interpretations about the commonalities that they identified in their various stories. And so we also had the captions translated into four indigenous languages so that it wasn't just a book that was explain, explaining their stories in English. However, in this presentation, I'll just focus on the English captions um, so that we can all understand what, what was said. 
This book was developed at the exhibition um, that we had at the University of the Free State in 2019. And at the exhibition, students had their photos on display. The public was able to view their photos, have conversations with students, ask them questions about, about it. And we also had a panel discussion where four students, one from each university, spoke directly to, to the public in order to give them the, themselves and to engage with an academic audience, answering questions about their life what needed to change uh, for universities to be more inclusive for students like them. So we also produced two process videos. Um, one of them is the one that I just tried to, to play before that had a, a few problems. So in that one, we were basically capturing um, what we thought the value of a participatory strand in our research would be. Um, but later on, I will hopefully manage to play another video where we see what students say they got out of the process, so what they valued about it and what they learned. So now I'm going to move on to share with you uh, the collective photo story that students produced together. They decided on the title. They selected 10 photographs. Each photograph has a title and an extended caption. And I'm going to take you through each of these story, each of the photographs. So the title of the story is The Bitter Truth of Success. The first photograph is titled The Unknown. Here students wanted to reflect on how they were excited about going to university, that they were journeying to a completely unfamiliar place, that they didn't know what to expect, what university would be like, what learning would be like, and what it would actually mean to be a university student. And so you can see in the photograph that you, you can see the road and the trees sort of in the distance, but there isn't really a clear idea of what happens in between. In the second photograph, which is titled Imali, that's a Nguni word for money, and we see a Turan coin sort of buried in the dirt. And here students wanted to highlight that a lack of money hinders everything, and it stops them from pursuing their dreams of a bright future. The third photograph is titled Live or Leave, and we see here a suitcase outside a building that has what we call security gates in South Africa, the gate is locked and this symbolizes both the fact that many students um, were given the ultimatum to either pay the outstanding fees, outstanding rent, etc. or they would literally be locked out of their place of residence or in other ways they'd be locked out of accessing um, university. So they explain this by saying financial challenges makes them feel as if they're being shut out and that all doors are locked to them. The next photograph is titled Worries and Compromise. And what you see there is a very narrow bre uh, bed and in quite a small space, you can see some pots there on the desk next to the window. And students here wanted to highlight the fact that a lack of money means a lack of choice and they have to opt for poor and cramped living conditions, sharing with two, three, four other students at times and cooking also in a small room. So doing almost everything that they need to be able to do to function as university students and not having optimal spaces within which to live while they were at university. And it's important here also to note that most of the students um, in our project lived off campus during their time at university. So they also had to commute daily to university campuses, but they didn't always have enough taxi fare, for instance, to travel to and from school. So they also highlight that they didn't always have enough money to eat or money for transport. So that would be transport to get from home to university campuses on a daily basis. The next photograph is quite self-explanatory. We see a stop sign there in the middle. It's titled Obstacles to our University Path. And they just want to bring our attention to the fact that having financial constraints um, hinders their process of learning. As a result of this, many students experienced um, academic failure, so failing many modules, having to retake modules, not being able to focus on their studies because they constantly worried about 
how they'd managed to be there, how they'd managed to afford tuition fees, uh, a laptop, textbooks, etc., particularly in the first two years of university before most of them secured funding. So they wanted to acknowledge that they know that education is a key to success for life, but in many ways it was being broken. Um, and this was linked to financial difficulties that they had because they couldn't afford most of what they needed in order to be successful university students. This photograph is quite uh, dark and unfortunately you sort of can't see, but there is a, a student who sort of crouched in the corner um, and she took the photograph like this deliberately and the whole group thought it um, very well sort of captured what it means to be um, going through university with feelings of um, depression, isolation, because they had to constantly worry about money, they were worried about academic success, and they had many negative thoughts about whether or not they would make it, and if university was indeed a place for them that they deserved to have access to, and that they could actually be successful within. So it's titled, The Struggle is Real. In this photograph, we see a kind of turning point in the story where students talked a lot about the need to adapt and realizing that there were many things about universities that wouldn't change uh, during their time at university. And so they realized that they had to adapt. They had to figure out how to fit in. They had to not think about the fact that other students had more material resources than they did, but that they had to make do with what they had. And so this they explained by saying the quicker, the better. So the quicker you adapt, the better. And they had to be introspective um, in order to overcome the differences and being able to fit in as a university student. In the next photograph, we see them reflecting more on teaching and learning conditions, um, particularly in terms of having lecturers who care. Um, and this is titled The Bowl of Fruit. I think the student mentioned to us in one of the workshops that they had a teacher who had a bowl of fruit at her desk. And so it was easy for him to sort of, you know, as he goes in there, whether to hand in an assignment or talk to her to grab a piece of fruit. And he didn't necessarily have to, in that instance, explain that he was hungry or that he hadn't had breakfast. But the bowl of fruit being there for any student to take means that students didn't have to feel um, sort of stigmatized or, or feel shame in, in having access to perhaps what might be the only piece of fruit that they had um, at that point of the day. So they said um, any student can take a piece of fruit um, and that it makes a difference to have the care and the support of lecturers, but also to have a relationship with them. In the next photograph, we continue to see the, you know, the things that help students to get through their time at university. And this photograph is titled Friendship. Um, they talked a lot about how valuable it was to know people like them, to learn from the workshops that they were other young people who were struggling with similar challenges. But they acknowledged that working together um, and having friends with whom they could walk through this higher education journey together, but also work and study together and study groups and so forth, led to good results. Um, and that this aided their achievement of the goals that they had set for themselves so that they could settle into the university space, um, even though it kind of remained unfamiliar to most students throughout their time at university. The next photograph is titled Thriving Through Difficulty. And we see a weed sort of emerging through the, the crevices of those rocks. And here they wanted to make the point that although they were facing ongoing obstacles, they were managing to grow regardless of the environment, which they acknowledged was not favorable to students like them. Finally, in the last photograph, um, students titled it Light at the End. And here they wanted to emphasize the fact that determination and hard work, which they saw themselves as hard workers, they spoke about hard work, we hear them talk about hard work and we can see through looking at how they progressed despite their challenges that they really are hard workers. But they also acknowledge the support of others, whether the support came um, from friends as it showed in the previous photograph, but also from their families um, because the hopes that the families had in terms of knowing that 
the potential for their families to be lifted out of poverty laid in the hands of their, their children um, in terms of them succeeding at university and potentially securing um, a job which would enable them to give back to their communities, but not only in terms of material resources, but what the value of a university education could mean for the families and also for the wider community. So the support of others and our families' hopes, students said, will bring us into light from darkness. In addition to creating the collective photo story, students also drafted a charter for an inclusive university, drawing on their stories. Um, and I thought it, would, it was important to highlight this. So in previous presentations, we talked a lot about the individual stories. But what I want to bring our attention to today is the fact that students drafted a charter for inclusive universities, which we see as a reasonable set of demands. As I take you through these five key points for how a university can be made more inclusive, um, you'll see that students not only identified problems that were common to their university experiences as low income youth, but where possible, they also gave suggestions for how this could be done. So symbolizing that they're not expecting somebody else to kind of come up with the solutions, but they were using their knowledge and their experience to actually make reasonable and doable, um, achievable um, recommendations for change. So the five key points for how university can be made more inclusive based on what students said, and this is a charter that they drafted themselves with only minimal sort of um, assistance from the research team to bring all of these ideas together and to cluster them. But the first key area is outreach and access. Students see it important for universities to forge good relationships um, with rural high schools. So taking universities to rural schools and districts, providing information for how um, high school students can actually apply for university, how they can apply for funding and so forth, but also creating a range of information and inductive uh, programs so that students are more aware of what they need while they're at university. They also thought that it would be good for university induction programs to include food and accommodation for those who require it. So we heard many stories of registration or the registration process being very tedious and sometimes taking days. So you might expect it to be a sort of straightforward um, process, but it tends to take very long. And for students like the Mirato students who might have moved, for instance, from the Limpopo province to study in Gauteng, the option to travel back to university campus and complete the registration process isn't as um, it's not as simple for somebody who lives close to the university campus because in the meantime they have to find a place to stay um, they have to figure out how to eat where to get food how to travel there daily um, and this is because until students are registered um, they cannot basically access the university residence on campus and usually until they're registered students they also wouldn't have secured accommodation off campus either the second uh, key point is student welfare. So students recommended that universities establish food programs. Um, for example, reasonably priced cafeterias on all university campuses where low income students in particular can afford to eat nutritious meals twice a day. They also thought it would be helpful to set up a wellness center and ensure students feel comfortable in accessing these. So we realized that many students were either unaware of the fact that universities did have um, sort of wellness centers, or if they knew that they were there, they didn't necessarily feel comfortable um, to access these. So it's not just about having them in place, but it's making them accessible so that students don't feel shame um, in seeking that kind of help. And they also said it was really important to supply reliable and accessible information for assistance in applying for financial aid. So in the first two years of university, we see that many students hadn't secured funding because either they were unaware of the options that they had. Some didn't know that they qualified to apply, for example, for the National Student Financial Aid Scheme and others who were aware that there were options were kind of clueless about how to go about these processes um, which are not simple at all and require a lot of documentation and and so forth 
And finally, um, as I said before, most of the students were living off campus, and so they thought it was important for universities to provide safe and reliable transport for off campus students, whether it's in the form of shuttle buses, etc. So that the students who live off campus and majority of students in South Africa do don't have as much difficulty in attending classes on a daily basis if they don't have taxi fare, for example. The last three key points are inclusive teaching, access to ICT and teaching spaces. So in terms of good teaching, students recommended that all lecturers should um, have be well qualified, first of all, so trained, uh, well trained and also caring. Um, they thought it was important for universities to provide more training for lecturers use of ICT platforms because they felt that this wasn't happening effectively. So it was hindering their communication with lecturers when they did try to use existing uh, platforms for communicating with them. We heard a few examples um, at the university in, in, in the Free State province of lecturers who we're still using Afrikaans uh, to have discussions or to talk to students during the class, despite the fact that the English, the language policy changed, um, necessitating lecturers to only use English. So they thought that although policy has changed and lecturers should be using English, this wasn't necessarily happening and it needed to be emphasized to make sure that it was actually being practiced. And they also recommended that students who registered late would have material available to them in order to for them to be able to catch up on what they might have missed should they have registered late and therefore not have been able to attend the first few lectures. In terms of access to ICT, and this is pre-COVID, the students were talking already a lot about this and how a lack of access to ICT, both in terms of students having access to computer laboratories at the university, but also the importance of students having their own laptops so that they could work on assignments and, and, and submit them and so forth while they were off campus. Another big issue was access to the internet um, and also the university making sure that students had free and timely workshops to know how to use computers. Um, as we mentioned earlier on, many students attended poorly resourced schools. So this often meant that being at university was the first time that they had access to uh, computers or learning how to type and submit assignments online and so forth. And they were having to learn how to do this while they're figuring out how to adjust, while they're thinking about um, their funding, while they're figuring out whether or not they're going to be at university the next day or be kicked out of their accommodation. So these are all things that are that clearly compounded to make their university um, transition and their participation really difficult. Again, they emphasized universities not neglecting students who live off campus in terms of providing internet services for off campus students. And the example that they provided is that universities should be entering into partnerships um, with internet providers so that even if internet access isn't free, it should definitely be cheaper than what it is because it's very expensive um, and most students can't afford uh, to actually have internet access if they live off campus. Finally, um, and this is particularly for students who are registered at historically disadvantaged universities, um, they talked about the need for universities to address the overcrowding in their lecture halls as well as the lack of equipment like projectors and so forth. Um, I mean, this is this is clear. It obviously hinders um, engagement in processes of learning. So although this was only mentioned mostly by students at historically disadvantaged universities, they wanted to include this in the charter. So reflecting on what students said from their individual stories, looking at what they the story that they told in the collective one and looking at the charter for an inclusive university made us understand or realize that disrupting power and knowledge asymmetries through participatory research methods like photo voice is actually symbolic of delinking from coloniality and this is because it allows for more equal participation between those who have more power in this case us as researchers and those who might have less of it, um, like research participants. We think this has decolonial value in the South African context because knowledge 
is typically produced in ways that silences marginal identities. Knowledge is also produced in ways that reinforces inequalities in higher education that already linger in wider society due to coloniality as well as the legacies of apartheid. So we think participatory methods like photo voice, although photo voice is only one example of a participatory method, we think it does have the potential to disrupt value hierarchies that have pushed African and indigenous worldviews to the margins of university. And so we think that participatory processes can also help us to avoid testimonial injustice. So it can help us avoid having prejudice about who has knowledge, who has knowledge that is valuable and worth hearing or worth listening to, worth engaging with, um, and whether people have the resources to render their knowledge intelligible to others. And what we think the Photo Voice project shows is that the students are both intelligent and they can render their knowledge intelligible to us and to the public. So participatory research can help us avoid testimonial injustice by encouraging us to recognize as credible knowers and trusted testifiers, people who have been typically excluded from making epistemic contributions. I'm really hoping that this video is going to uh, play with, with less disruption than, than the previous one. And I think it is probably just an issue of um, an unstable internet connection. But I'm going to play this uh, video now and see how it goes. And in it, you will hear students speaking uh, and reading out basically excerpts of their reflections on first what they learned from Photo Voice, as well as how it made them feel. So here we get a sense of what students valued about the process of um, telling their stories to others and presenting these to the public, as well as what it meant for them to draft the, the Charter for Inclusive Education. Sorry, if Melanie and Nikateko switch off their videos, then the bandwidth might be better.
are here at the moment is with people who are trying to break the, the back of the AMC. Mikiteko, is, is that it? Are we going to take some questions now? You're on mute, by the way. I still just had the last okay. um, sort of slide to talk about how drawing from the student testimonies um, and what they said in the video, uh, which is that they felt that they had a safe space to narrate their stories. They were impressed by how other people were able to articulate their stories. They recognized that they weren't alone in their struggles um, and that they appreciated having the opportunity to draw from their personal experiences and potentially share knowledge that would um, make a difference to other students' university trajectories. So drawing from, from what they said um, in these videos, but then also their written reflections on what they learned and how the Photo Voice uh, project made them feel. We think that um, it enabled three intersecting capabilities, basically, um, that are linked to the capability for epistemic contribution. So that's self-recognition in terms of them recognizing themselves as intelligent and uh, young people who could render their intelligence or their knowledge intelligible to others and recognizing each other um, as people who could actually make valuable contributions to shared pools of knowledge, but also mutual recognition in terms of the role that the relationships that they had with other people like them at university and their family members, etc., who were keeping them going uh, through university as well as the development of critical and creative skills um, that they developed from uh, using their stories and basically telling them through photographs and learning how to take photographs that were um, emotive and using captions that would really capture very well what they were trying to say about what it's like to be a university student when you come from a low income household. Um, so yeah, in, in summary, we, we see the simultaneous expansion of, of these capabilities as foundational to more epistemic justice um, and also symbolic of a decolonial ethic, even under non-ideal conditions. Yeah. I'll now hand over to Monica, who will take us through um, explaining the capability-based learning outcomes that we identified from our research. Um, are we going to go straight on then and, and take some questions at the end? Should we do, do it that way? So, so Monica, you go straight on and then whatever time we've got uh, left over at the end, we can use for questions. Um, I can't see any slides, and I don't know whether anybody else can. I can I can see the slide. You can see the slide. OK, I'm going to assume that um, everybody can see the slide, which I can't now. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to be talking about the project um, and, and to hear again about the photo voice. So if you can see the slide, um, I'm going to talk about the eight capability domains and associated functionings. So on the left of the slide, you have the eight domains, um, and these were derived from um, two sources. The first was talking to the students in life history interviews over um, four years. We started talking to them when they're in their second year of study, and what they told us, in fact, during the Photo Voice project, which we've, we've just um, seen but also from research and theory about the effects of living in poverty and about human well-being and flourishing. Um, so these capability domains represent what uni university education might offer in the way of opportunities and freedoms for students to be and do what they value, um, or opportunities and freedoms to live the life that they choose to live. 
Now, for each capability domain, um, we've identified a key functioning, which is down on the um, right of the slide. And these can be thought of as learning outcomes because unlike capabilities, which are, which are actually possibilities, a functioning is an actual doing or being when potential obstacles to choice have been removed or when means and resources have been converted to um, a practical realization. So I'd like to concentrate for the next few minutes on the on the functionings. Now, these functionings can be thought of as pertaining both to the university student while they're participating in university and to the graduate when she or he has moved on to life after university as a citizen or a worker. Um, and what we found by the end of the study, and that was in the sixth year of their um, higher education experience, that students both as a group and in and individually were differently positioned in relation to different functionings as they left university. So the first one being an epistemic contributor. So in the context of university education, we think that epistemic contribution is what Martha Nussbaum calls an architectonic capability. That is that it organizes and pervades all the others in a capability set. So this functioning, um, and I think there's a lot of resonance here with what Mikatiko has been saying, refers to being a knower and a teller and a listener at university and in society. And the knowledge is thought of as plural. So there is the, the kind of knowledge uh, that should be respected of the students in their book, The Bitter Truth of Success, about being a university student and how it's experienced. But also within this, the, the, the knowledge of fields and interdisciplines that the students acquire at university is, is absolutely key. And the aim here is that they're transformed by this knowledge, by having opportunities to reason and to understand and to apply it critically and so on. And so like narrative capability, epistemic contribution is closely related to what's known as epistemic justice. Um, being able to be a knower in society. And we did find students having a transformational um, relationship with no knowledge, but it was very uneven. And there's probably a, more that universities can do to organise curriculum and pedagogy for this functioning. Um, the second one, planning a good life. Now, this capability is associated with um, the the, the capability of practical reason, which is often on lists of capability. So at university and throughout life, students and graduates should have the means and disposition to form ideas about what at any time constitutes for them a good life and to make decisions and to take the steps to achieve such a life. Um, so this in, these means and dispositions include knowledge and information, but also aspirations, confidence, independence, all of which uh, a university education can support. Navigation of university and society's culture and systems. So as we've seen, um, for most Mirato students, excitement at university gave way to having to deal with an alien environment. Now, most of the Mirato students achieve this functioning quickly with not much assistance from the universities, describing it, as we saw in their book, as adapting or adaptation. And Tari Yosso, um, within the theory of community wealth, thinks of navigation as a capital with which to deal with barriers. So it includes identifying what needs adapting to, seeking support from others, as well as giving it and, and staying power, all of which our students um, showed evidence of. Now, being employable. So employability is the most expected learning outcome from university. And it's reasonable to expect that university students, especially those from low income households without networks and connections, will be given preparation to find a graduate level job, either in the public or the private sector, or uh, preparation for self-employment or for further study. Yet we did find rather large gaps here. Either students were not made aware of support or it was not available. 
in the main, they navigated for themselves the transition between um, university and life afterwards. Um, being connected to, the functioning of being connected to and concerned for the well-being of others is the functioning associated with the capability of Ubuntu. So as expected, the students brought Ubuntu with them to university and exercised it throughout, supporting each other through good and bad times, and it was critical to their um, being able to stay the course. Um, Mikatika has dealt with the functioning of telling one's own um, story. And as she said, 19 of the Mirato students did have this opportunity or freedom and they benefited greatly from it. Um, so what I'd like to point out here is that most university students don't get an opportunity like this. So it might be worthwhile for universities to consider how to provide the opportunity of freedom for these students who do have, who are facing an alien environment to tell their stories. And then um, being a respected and participating member of university and society. So we can see from the charter that Mikoteko showed us that there was a lot of leeway for universities to do more and in fact their demands are comparatively modest but will make a lot of difference to their experience of being part of the university rather than struggling on the edges of it. Dealing with stress and the worry of challenges associated with emotional balance which is of course is important to everyone and we would have wished that the Mirata students had not had to have the objectively situations that they did which were mainly, mainly uh, related to lack of money and lack of resources. But they did deal with the stress and worry because mainly because of opportunities provided by families and friends and other significant relationships. They were able to sustain their determination and hard work and perseverance. So I'd say that the Murato students beings and doings were strongly focused on themselves and others they identified with passing modules and gaining their qualification. All have stayed the course um, and it's because they've managed to function in these ways. Yet the arrangements at universities could be strengthened to support them more. Um, Mikatika, could you go to the next slide? Is it, is it there now? Yes, it is. OK, thanks. Um, so this afternoon we've provided a glimpse into what we've done in the Mirato project and we hope that you've whetted, whetted your appetite and there are other opportunities coming up to learn more and go deeper. First, there's the final conference of the project, opportunities, obstacles and outcomes, exploring the experiences and achievement and the capability sets of low income youth at five universities in South Africa. Um, it was booked for June the 2nd in Johannesburg, but I think it's now being thought that it might be online on a different date, but probably in June. Melanie might have more to say about that. And then secondly, we're close to completing a book on the project. Um, it'll be published later this year and will be an open access book published by African Minds. Thanks very much. Um, thanks very much, Patience, Mikateko and, and Monica. We envisage that this webinar in a way would be a kind, would both say more about the Photo Voice project and focus on that, but also be a kind of taster for the longer event where we'll look in much more detail at um, access, participation, success and, and look in more detail at this multidimensional capability set that's emerged from, from the work. We have um, a little bit of time for questions. So um, if anybody wants to pose a question in the chat room or, or raise their hands and, and ask a question, now, now's the moment. Okay, we've got a question about were there specific ethical considerations that had to be borne in mind when using this approach as opposed to traditional approaches. Mikateko, do you want to have a go at answering that? Sure. Um, one of the 
obvious um, sort of ethical considerations that we had to make was around anonymity um, and making sure that um, we still respected um, the right for students not to have their names, uh, their real names sort of appear in the stories that they took. Um, and at the same time, this was a major challenge because the whole point of participatory research methodologies like these is for research participants to be at the forefront, to have the opportunity to speak, to have direct contact and communication with the public, because the idea is that the photographs that they present um, should stimulate dialogue uh, with the public and ideally open up spaces to engage with people who are in positions to, to change or influence policy. And so without having opportunities for students at the exhibition to, to do this and to tell their own stories in their own words, in their own voices, to have the photographs um, displayed publicly, um, it, it was difficult to, to sort of figure out a balance between those things. So what we did is at the public exhibition, um, that's the space that we allowed students to engage directly with the public. But as you saw with the photo book, the collective photo book that I shared with you today, we don't reveal anything about the universities where the students were located. Um, their real names don't appear in the book and none of the photographs um, can easily tell you where students were located. So in terms of what we have in print and what we present and what we have written about in our forthcoming book. Um, anonymity is uh, kept in, in check because we use pseudonyms uh, throughout all of those publications, but it was important for them to have the opportunity to tell their stories directly to the public, um, at least at the, at the exhibition. Thanks, Mikiteko. And I just want to add to that. I think the challenge was that the participatory project was part of a bigger project, and the bigger project had a more sort of traditional set of ethical requirements. And there might be, it might be an issue about rather not doing that and having um, a, a different kind of uh, set of ethical um, principles if you're doing participatory research. I think it's quite difficult if it's wrapped into a bigger project, so it was um, it was a challenge. Um, then we've got a question about what cameras the participants used and did they work in groups? Um, and then also a question about what's happened to the charter? Has it gone to anybody and has there been a response? Do you want to respond to that, Mikateko? Both both of those. All right, so I'll start with the, the easy one in terms of the cameras that they use. So we have um, some digital cameras um, at the research group, which we lent out to students during this time. So they're sort of the small Canon um, digital cameras that they, they worked with, and they only had them during the time that they were basically involved in the project, but they kept them uh, sort of overnight and throughout the weekend or during the process that they were busy working on their photo stories. Um, and some students also took, you know, selfies or other fun photographs that they kept uh, for themselves. Um, did they work in groups? So we didn't, we weren't strict um, about how they should approach this. And what we saw was a different approach at different um, provinces. So whereas in, in Gauteng and the Free State, students took more of an individual approach, you know, deciding to sort of go out on their own and, and focus on um, what the, cap the photographs that they wanted to capture. We realized that at, um, in Limpopo, they worked more together. However, because some of the photographs were staged, so for example, um, with there's in the photograph where students are kind of walking together, um, that's not necessarily an example of one that was staged, but if students needed somebody to look like they were studying or look like they were busy reading something, then they did ask somebody in the group to kind of uh, pose so that they could take a staged photograph. So they mostly worked alone, but they did certainly draw on each other, um, especially for advice on whether the photograph was good or if they needed somebody to pose for a staged photograph. So they mostly worked alone, but they did... Um, collaborate um, to capture the photographs. And the next question, what happened to the charter? Um, I mean, I, I think it was really important to 
presented here because we haven't really done so at in, in other places. We did present the charter at the exhibition. So um, alongside the photo stories, there was a section in the hall where we had printed the charter in writing so people could actually uh, read it and see what students were recommending. But um, we haven't been able as yet to take it further. I do have the intention to um, write a piece in the conversation that centers around this charter and making the point that students were able to come to conclusions and make recommendations that I think um, are recommendations that um, any good researcher would have come to similar conclusions about some of the things that need to change in universities and it again makes the point about how they have um, valuable knowledge to contribute to our understanding of what needs to change to make universities more inclusive so i'd personally like to see more being done uh, with the charter and it's one of the things that um, a student raised in our last interview last year um, when towards the end of the interview, we typically ask students what they if they have any questions and um, they all want to know what's going to happen with this. And there's a sense of frustration that we know so much about what can change. Um, but we also have to acknowledge that there are limitations of how far we can take this forward and whether or not people who are in um, better position to or, or whose jobs or positions in the university lend themselves to making these changes. So I would certainly like uh, to see us do more with the charter um, and present it to people who are in positions to actually make uh, policy changes. But the whole point of Photo Voice is for um, these type of recommendations to come out and for us to work alongside students to share it with the public. I don't know if anybody else wants to add on on that. Um, yeah, we we need to do we need to go back to the charter and and think about what we what we do with that. I think that's absolutely right. Um, what what Mikiteko said. Uh, we've got two time for these last two comments. I mean, from from Sam Fongworth, it's it's probably more for us a reflection and a comment. So one of the students reflected on whether the university is the right place for, for them. And do we explore this from a point of a diversified higher education system and are all matric graduates made for university? And um, that's not something that we explored in the project or indeed in the book, because for these particular students, um, university is where they want to be. They more or less managing to to make their way. Some of them are taking longer than others. I think there's a separate set of issues and discussion about a more sort of diversified um, post-school system. But related to that, Sam asked, how can matriculants be supported in finding the right space? Uh, from the evidence of, of our project, there's very, very little support for students from low income backgrounds, um, both in terms of choosing their subjects at grade 10 and then making decisions about what to do after, after grade 12. So even, I mean, there's just not that kind of career support and advice, and there clearly needs to be a lot more done so that options are, are brought to schools, especially to rural schools and can be discussed and career paths and so on can, can be explored. So at the moment, very little is done in our experience um, about choosing university, never mind choosing other uh, possibilities. And then there's a comment from Via Piaval about do we know similar projects uh, based on capabilities frameworks at other higher education institutions, especially in the context of developing countries. Um, I personally am not aware of a lot of other projects. There's been a very interesting project at a private university in Colombia where there was a whole, um, a, led by the rector, sort of a whole university project around developing a set of capabilities which would hold for that particular university as an institution and as a system. And I think that's quite an interesting project to, to read about. So ours is doing something different because it's students across many universities and, and it's bottom up. And we would hope to generate a set of domains which can then be discussed um, and, and so on. But I don't know if any of the others want to want to comment on what Via Pirvan has said. Um, I mean, Patience says your work on, on Zimbabwe, which looked at capabilities in the relation in relationship to 
higher education and the public and and quality in higher education. Um, Bertha Cabona has done research on looking at higher education and relation uh, capabilities in relation to the public good at two universities in, in Tanzania. So the work that we know of is actually coming out of our group and out of our, our PhD students. Um, does anybody want to add to that? Um, I think there's a comment from Sonia rather than a question, Sonia Lutz saying that the findings correlate with their students' success work and the challenge they have from a practical point, point of view, scaling support and pedagogical interventions and creating intersections between development and development initiatives and also awareness of, of support. And I think the scaling issue is a systemic one and probably really important. Um, I think I'm going to, uh, we do to finish at quarter past three, so um, I'll invite Mika to take her patience and Monica. I don't know if any of you want to make any, any final comments. Um, no, no, no final comments um, from my side, just to thank everybody for, for being here. And I do hope that there will be people who join us at the final uh, conference to hear more about the project. Um, yeah, so so thank you all for being here and for, for, for listening. And I noticed that there are a few uh, students who had been invited um, and it's great to, to see some joining us here as well. And hopefully people will get to also in, engage with them directly um, at the conference, whether it be in person or online. So thank you all very much. OK, I also want to add my thanks to everybody and to encourage people who are interested in the project to come to the final colloquium slash uh, conference. The work is very, very rich and it will be an opportunity to hear in, in much more detail about the transitions and trajectories of this particular group. And we're also very, very interested and keen on getting feedback and debate around our multidimensional capability set and, and what people think of it and whether they think it, it can be useful and used in, in any way. Um, so thanks very much to everybody for coming. Thanks to Lucretia for organizing this for us. Um, thanks to uh, Carmen Martinez Vargas, who helped us a lot with the Photo Voice project, and also to Melissa Lucas, who helped us when we um, had the conference at the University of the Free State. And of course, our thanks to the students who participated in the Photo Voice project and in the project as a whole, and who, who stayed with us and allowed us to be part of their lives for, for over four years. So thanks very much, everybody. That's it. Um, oh, thank you for the thank you for the hand clapping. <laughs> um, that's that's the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Mikateko, can we have a short discussion either sure. now or tomorrow about whether to go online or whether to